I've produced a few videos now explaining how our auditory systems are more sensitive and accurate than many of the audio measurement devices, at least when it comes to understanding how we actually perceive audio. But our auditory systems are also quite gullible. They're easily fooled. So let's celebrate April Fool's Day by tricking our brains and our ears a little bit and discussing the how and the why of it. This should be a lot of fun. And thank you to the viewer who suggested that I should balance the videos where I talked about how great our auditory system was with some discussion of how it can get fooled. I couldn't find your name anywhere in the comment section to call out who you are, but you'll know who you are. Thank you. We'd better start all this off with a little bit of context. Humans haven't evolved in a vacuum. Obviously, we'd have died. What I mean by that is that up until recently, at least on the evolutionary scale of things, we had to survive regular environmental threats. And to do this, all of our senses were required. What that led to is that humans have evolved to leverage all of our senses to make the best sense of what's going on around us. And it's because of that multimodal use of our senses that we've become very good at surviving in the real world and easily tricked by artificial situations and stimuli. One example, I guess, is that we can listen to a stereo pair of speakers or headphones and perceive a soundstage. That's an imaginary sonic landscape that doesn't actually exist. It's entirely in our heads. But that's a familiar example. Let's talk about some others that you might not be aware with, and we're going to start with a fun one. Before we do, though, I want to give a quick shout out to the sponsor of this video, and that's Dakoni Audio. Dakoni make a bunch of different accessories for headphones and earphones, including things like ear tips, pads, modular headphone cables, and carry cases. As channel sponsors, they've been kind enough to offer a 10% discount to anybody making a purchase from their site, all you need to do is use the code PASSIONFORSOUND10. Doing so will provide you with a 10% discount and will also share a little bit of the sale back with the channel to help support the channel to grow. So you're supporting yourself and at the same time, you're supporting me. Thank you for any and all support. Now, let's get to that fun example. I'm going to show you some coloured balls appearing on the screen and each time they're going to be accompanied by a sound. Pay attention to the location of the balls and the location to the sounds. Where did the sounds come from each time? Was it spatially aligned with the coloured ball? In other words, did it come from the same location as the ball? No, it didn't. The sound was identically positioned every single time. It was a centred stereo sound for all of the balls. However, due to the synchronised timing of the ball and the sound, your brain might have decided that the sound was coming from where the ball was. Let us know in the comments if you heard the sound shift with the ball and also what setup you were using. I suspect this won't work as well on a smartphone as it would on a TV with a set of stereo speakers or maybe even a surround sound setup. Just in case that one didn't work for you, let me show you another one that's almost guaranteed to work no matter what device you're using. The McGurk effect was named after Harry McGurk, who first discussed this along with his research partner, John McDonald. Let me show you the McGurk effect before I explain it. Ba, ba, ba. In this illusion, you hear a person saying one sound, while you see a person saying a slightly different sound. What happens for most people is that you hear a sound, you perceive a sound that's in between the two cues. In this case, a sound being made at the front of the mouth was combined with a sound being made at the back of the mouth. Most people will hear a sound that's more made towards the middle of the mouth. What's even more curious is that even after you know exactly what's going on, most people can't alter what they hear. Here, try again. Mama, mama. Mama. So those are all visual and auditory illusions combined, but let's also play with some pure auditory illusions. For example, this rhythm is not changing tempo. That didn't actually speed up. It just seemed to because the rising pitch of the regular note being played and some of the additional high frequency elements played in amongst the rest of the rhythm. The main low frequency beat never shifted its tempo. Let me play it again and just focus on the low regular beat and you'll notice that it doesn't actually change speed even though it seems to. That 
That effect is known as Risset's rhythmic effect. Jean-Claude Risset, or Risset, also got up to mischief with Roger Shepard when together they produced the Shepard Risset Glissando. You'll have heard one of these before if you've watched the movie Dunkirk. Basically, it does with pitch what Risset's rhythmic effect does with tempo. It sounds like it's constantly increasing in pitch. In this case, the notes do increase in pitch to a degree, but they only go so far before being replaced with another set of notes starting at the exact same lower starting pitch. This creates the illusion of a continuously increasing pitch, but it's actually just a cycle of the same pitches over and over. Let's try one more as we transition into how some of these auditory phenomena could actually be helping us. One cool trick that our ears can play is to understand notes even when some frequencies are missing. We can refer to this trick as the missing fundamental trick. Whenever an instrument plays a note like the lowest A note on a piano, it produces the main frequency of that note as well as a bunch of harmonics. In the case of the lowest A on the piano, the fundamental frequency or the main frequency is 27.5 hertz. It then produces harmonics at 55 hertz, at 82.5 hertz, 110 hertz, and 137.5 hertz, and so on and so forth. Now, imagine you have a speaker that can't play 27.5 hertz. Let's say it's pretty much done by 50 hertz. If the lowest A note on a piano is recorded and then played through that speaker, you'll only hear the 55 hertz harmonic and above. What you'll perceive though, is that you're hearing the lowest note on a piano. And why I find that particularly fascinating is that the next A up on a piano also has a frequency 55 hertz, but we don't hear that note. We hear the lower one. You might wonder why that is. I know I certainly did. And what it comes down to is that if you were to hit the 55 hertz A key on a piano, it's going to produce the 55 hertz frequency, the 110, the 165, and so on and so forth. It's not going to produce the 82.5 hertz or the 137.5 hertz or any of those odd multiples of 27.5 hertz. Our brain knows that. And so it recognizes the mixture of frequencies and knows what the base fundamental frequency is and it hears the fundamental frequency, even if it's missing. Pretty clever, isn't it? It's also why you can enjoy most music on speakers that don't necessarily go all the way down to 20 hertz. I'm not saying that full range frequency extension isn't important for enjoying music, just that we can get by without it sometimes. And so let's wrap things up now by talking about some interesting challenges and some interesting potential benefits brought about by the complexity of our cross-modal processing of our senses. It's clear that our auditory systems can be tricked, and it's true that we need to be careful of that when we're auditioning audio gear. But does all of this mean that we should never trust our auditory systems? Not at all. I'm sure you've all enjoyed optical illusions sometimes, but I'm guessing that you still tend to probably believe what you see in the majority of situations in real life. It's the same with our ears. They can be tricked, but it doesn't mean they're constantly lying to you. What's more, there's evidence that the interplay between our senses can make some really interesting things possible. For example, some restaurants use music and sound to change the experience of the food they're serving. There's also evidence that visual cues can enhance our hearing. And that's true for visual cues that don't actually have any relevance to what you're hearing. A study by Bologna et al. found that having a light showing in the approximate similar location to a very, very quiet, what they call near threshold sound, improved participants' abilities to hear the sound. The light wasn't signaling when the sound was playing, it was just on in a general location similar to where the sound was coming from, and yet it improved their ability to notice that sound, to actually perceive that it was playing. When the light was off, a lot of people never heard the sound, but the sound was still at the same volume. And so somehow just having a light, a random, meaningless light in roughly the same location, improve people's auditory perception. And the rest of that study that I've linked in the description below for you, if you want to look at it, shows that various other unrelated visual cues improved the auditory capabilities of the participants in the studies. And this example has some real life implications too. If you're not a lip reader, 
Seeing somebody's mouth move probably doesn't let you know what they're saying. However, being able to see the person who's doing the talking has been shown in multiple tests to improve the ability of the listener to understand what's being said, even in difficult auditory situations. Let me demonstrate. To do so, I'm going to make the screen go blank for a second, but don't switch off. Just listen carefully. Right now, I am saying something that you probably can't understand me. Let me say that again. Right now, I'm saying something, and you probably can understand me. Those two sentences were exactly the same, except for just two small words changed. Most of you would have had trouble understanding me the first time, though. Less of you would have had trouble the second time. The volume of both statements was matched, and the volume of the noise over the top or behind it was also matched. The difference was that you could see my face and the movements of my mouth for the second statement. That's all. And that's somehow enough for our brains to better understand and process the sound. And when I discovered all this research, it raised some questions for me. I don't have answers for these questions yet, but let me share them with you anyway. I wondered how this plays into the discussion of sighted versus blind testing. Does being able to see the products while we're listening somehow improve our auditory acuity? Would looking at any audio device, not just the ones we're necessarily listening to, also make us better listeners? Is listening with our eyes open actually better than listening with our eyes closed for critical listening? I know that listening with my eyes closed often leads to a more immersive listening experience, so what does that mean in the context of all of this? I think it probably tells us that there's still Still so much more to learn about our auditory systems, auditory processing, and even the cross-modal influences of our different senses. And so I'm going to leave this video here with an increased sense of curiosity and intrigue about the auditory world. I hope you feel the same. If you're keen to keep exploring though, I think you'll find this video interesting. It's about how we can improve our hearing and have a bunch of fun with one very easy activity. For now though, thank you to YouTube channel members, thank you to channel Patreon members, and thank you to those of you who leave super thanks on videos like this one. And until next time, happy listening, be kind to each other, and I'll see you here again soon on Passion for Sound.